โอเค Good evening to everyone here, and good morning to those listening from Singapore, joining us from Singapore. Welcome to you all, and it's a great opportunity to discuss Dharma, <coughs> and particularly meaningful if we could bring it into practice and integrate it with our. Mind, so that it not only gets purified, but also influences our body and speech. So, not that you need to be reminded of this, but it's good to bring this up so that we could have a fresh, renewed appreciation of this session that we have in front of us, and. Determined to make it the most we can. So the first few minutes we'll try to sit in quiet meditation, where we try to bring our mind and body to this present moment. Trying to be fully in sync with the real, real time happening here and now, but within the body. Be that by focusing on the sensations of the body, of the breath, as I would always like to say, trying to be. With something in one's awareness, do so with the three factors present to the extent possible: alertness, attention, some additional attention rather than letting the mind have free hand. Which was put oneself in the driver's seat, making the mind not pushing too hard, but making it the Gentlemen, sit on a chosen chosen object, and then try to carry on this awareness with a sense of delight, a sense of appreciation of the value of it. All of these combined together. Before we recite the homage to Shakyamuni Buddha, take a moment here in visualizing the merit field with Buddha Shakyamuni in the space above oneself, radiant in the nature of light, yet very discreet with his features, symbolic of a completely awakened. Enlightened being with the inner qualities of infinite love, compassion, wisdom, all of the possibilities having reached full potential, with nothing remaining in potential, all fulfilled under the wake, weight of which all negativities have been completely eliminated without any trace. Just looking at the teachings that the Buddha gave, multi-layer, 
multifaceted, yet all rooted in compassion. Complemented by unerring wisdom, opening our eyes to the reality that we have been so blinded from. Think of these qualities and others generate a sense of reverence, admiration, as well as a sense of gratitude for the great hardship ships that he undertook for the sake of all sentient beings and for bestowing this peerless teaching, stainless, peerless, incomparable teaching. If you feel comfortable, think of Buddha being blind by his disciples, other bodies out of us, filling the whole space above us. I think of other sentient beings, without exception, all joining us, filling the space around us, all in human forms, yet undergoing their own distinctive circumstances. Some are very horrible in that they don't have even the, even the shortest break from their suffering, continuous, incessant suffering. And those of us like taking a short break, yet still without food, so deeply steeped in the mire of samsara. Think of others by drawing from one's own examples of what you have been, what we have been through, what we might go through, what will it be like if we were born elsewhere. Just flex one's imagination in thinking and relating with others in different situations. Some better than us, some more grave. Of course, all of them generate this sense of compassion. Arising from the sense of empathy. Arising from a sense of our recognition of our basic sameness. sense of affinity, growing into a sense of empathy, be that of their present conditions, or more particularly of their suffering conditions. Let all of these give us strength for a sense of compassion. Indiscriminate compassion to us all. Anyone, so long as they are in samsara or they have not yet reached full awakening, there would be at least some shortcoming there to think of for them to be free from. Let this great compassion extending to all sins and peace, without exception, grow into a sense of bodhicitta, giving us the inspiration, the strength to aspire to become fully awakened, so that not only one would be completely freed of all shortcomings, but because of that one more importantly, able to serve others in the truest sense of the word. With our becoming a Buddha, there will be an additional Buddha 
who could relate to others, who could be more connected to others, completely otherwise, and thus reach out to others. Towards that end, we are gathered here to discuss Dharma. Before doing so, we pay our respect and homage to Buddha Shakyamuni Buddha and other Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Let's join together. <laughs> By way of strengthening this motivation that we have just generated in the form of Bodhicitta, try to think of how this is possible, what that is, what that would be like, how it would be different from how we are right now in terms of our conditions, situations capacities try to make a sense of this difference between oneself with all other sentient beings included on the one hand and the Buddhas and high level Bodhisattvas on the other hand how come Drawing from the strength of one's own understanding, reflections, insights, experiences. Try to come up with how could this aspiration be turned into a reality? What is the base reality that we have? that can be transformed. Some can be, some needed to be transformed, some needed to be transmuted. In the sense there's nothing of their nature needed to be changed, except something around them could be changed. Thus it's called transmutation. Oh. Well, transmutation, transformation, how you understand it, but there are things within us which needed to be stopped, which needed to be increased. Some, by their very nature, doesn't need any change in it, in it, in it, in it or for it, or on it, but rather around it. So in short, try to make a sense of how this aspiration at least have some kind of a intellectual knowledge of what the roadmap looks like and place oneself where one is. Try to connect the dots until the full awakening. From whatever level of understanding or vehicle that one may have. And let this all come alive in strengthening this aspiration to become Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. Sometimes it will be good to kind of lay a paper and write 
what one's understanding is as to the steps from here to here, here to here, and here. And see if there are gaps in between how they need to be filled in, where one is. And that's a woman. understands and knows for oneself what needs to be filled in, what needs to be clarified, like that. And that's how we will surely make progression day by day. And it will be true to our one of the contemplations. Rather the first one, I think, trying to improve our practice, be that in the sense of actually undertaking the practice, taking it a notch further, be that in terms of understanding what the road may be, the sense, the sensibility of the paths, etc. In Tibet, not that I have myself ever tried it, but in Tibet they used to have a game, Salam, Paths and Ground, but I've never played it. That was a mistake. Yeah. It's very similar to the, what is the game called? Lodo? Mm -hmm. But in, in, yes. What's in letters? I see. But usually we call it snake and ladder. So it's called. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. I've never myself tried it. It'll be good to learn. That would be a very good tool to have some play at the same time and kind of contribute to one's own understanding. How come this is here? This should not be here. How come? Because this text says that there's no fall. <laughs> From here, and if from this point it's secure, yeah, not like the usual one where even at ninety nine there is a snake <laughs> that can so that you would have a shoot all the way to one, <laughs> not like that, so yeah, it would be good, and then it could be even made uh even more. Sophisticated, you can have one from the Sutra point of view, one from the Tantra point of view. Ah, oh, that would be wonderful. Well, there's a game that Sakya Pandita made up. Is this it? This must be it. He was such a genius. Such a genius. So much so that he authored a text on Brahma, which is so authentic and authoritative. A Tibetan master who authored a text on Brahman at that early time. And he was so expert in Sanskrit like that. Yeah, yeah, it must be. There are other tools that I have never tried. I don't know how come I missed them. Some way of uh, praising someone. You compose a, a, a poem of praise to someone, and you kind of made it run almost like uh, almost like the almost like the table with columns, yeah, with columns and rows to fill in. What do you call that? Yeah, crossword. 
as well. Cross, cross word puzzles. Yeah, almost like that. But where you can read one stanza from like that. And the colors are kind of make it's called I think does she call some call some wheel. But usually it's in the form of a square. <laughs> But at least it runs, right? So in a colo in a colo style. Okay, so we'll push through the text a little bit. So we have come to Yeah. We have come to the reflections on page two eighty two, right? Mm -hmm. So let's take some time in reflecting on them. And then if people have feel like asking questions or maybe commenting, please feel free. We'll take these reflections one by one. Not that we'll be actually doing the reflection in a formal uh, time set, set aside for that. We could take moments in and reflecting on them. Reflect that the clear and cognizant nature of the mind is a stable basis for the cultivation of excellent qualities. What do you make of this? We have heard about this. What do you make of the clarity part, cognizant part? How that's a stable basis, how that makes case for stable basis for the cultivation of excellent qualities to, to kind of cumulatively grow into full bloom in that of the Buddha's state. Any thoughts, any here? Comments? We have to remember that in one context, everything Every phenomena, irrespective of whether that belongs to samsara or nirvana, is clear light in nature. Right? There we are not speaking of consciousness. But when we speak of clear light nature, clear and light nature of a consciousness, then we are speaking of consciousness in specificity. And that means different. Maybe using the same term, clear light, but we mean different. So this is what they, in English they call homonym. Same word, same spelling, same sound, yet different meaning. And then there is something called homograph, homophone. Same sound, spelled either differently or not. And then something called homeograph. What is that? I think something spelled and written same, but pronounced differently. So in, in Tibetan Buddhism, there are so many such homonyms. It's very important to to think of them in those terms so that one could understand them, put them in context. We'll come up with one, this, uh, we don't have to look far, this Rigpa mentioned here in the next chapter, so we could speak of how Rigpa, in the way it is, in the way it is spelled, written, pronounced, same to same, but means different in the scriptures. So, Anyway, this one, Vesel, Semjirahi Veselva, clear light. When we say cognizant, then it is specific to the mind. When we say clear light, because we use the same term for the mind, and then explain that, Veselva, Semjirahi Veselva, Jimandam Nalubo, then we explain that in terms of being clear and cognizant. But when we speak of this, in terms of everything, then we are speaking of things being 
freed from what might have been what what otherwise would have been a smear on their nature by which of them being free of inherent existence they are free from that otherwise it would have been a smear on their nature so in that sense they are called clear light and in terms of sentient beings we say that the sentient beings can become buddha because they are primarily buddha themselves because on the basis of being primarily buddha now there is the possibility of what do you call uh of of revealing its buddha nature it it it's its buddha word so there also there also the the mm, the consistency is maintained in terms of how the claim is made that no matter how mired steeped we may be entrenched our expectations may be there's this possibility of becoming fully freed of them because the mind itself is primarily clear primarily primordially clean so the term primordial is from the very beginning right from the very beginning or from from no beginning this time so there is even an expression ye sang ma ye nan zok sang mi ye if it weren't for us being primordially primordially clean we couldn't be cleaned up the tibetan term is ye sang zok sang If we aren't primarily clean or yeah clean of defilements by way of it having never made into the nature or the yeah nature of our mind which is by the way the primary basis of a sentient being of course it is always accompanied by a physical component not spoken of in the tantra in in the whole of in the whole trajectory of sutra teachings but nonetheless it is there if it weren't for that then our efforts would not be effective in becoming buddha so on the basis of this primordial purity we can in a way we can reinstate our purity and bring it up front bring it into a manifest form so clear and cognizant when we say clear and cognizant of course then that is specific to mind so clear and cognizant in the sense of some jira she was say what you mean in lobo so it has its quality of reflecting things in it yet at the same time connecting with it in a very unique subject object relationship yes please kishila could you comment on this particular line in terms of the natural dharmakaya that is naturally free of any stains Yeah, Rangxin, Rangxin Yang De. We call that Rangxin Yang De, natural liberation, natural Dharmakaya. So that's not. I mean, at least in the. I mean, not 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 that any of the Tibetan schools would say we are already Buddha in the literal literal sense, but some may use that expression, but none takes it. literally by saying that you don't need to do anything you're already buddha just just go you're already buddha don't come here <laughs> so what we mean by rangxin yang de rangxin chu natural dhammakaya is this natural purity 
natural purity. So here, in this respect, this Dharmakaya would be only spoken of in the in in the sense of uh, lack of any dirt or free from any de- defilements in the nature of our mind. So not in terms of some kind of a, a realization. That would not be possible. That's something to be attained later on. But at least when we attain full realization, what accompanies with that is the very basic nature of mind being clear would have always continued on. And that would become a part of the Buddha's, Buddha's, Buddha's kaya, Buddha's body. So when we speak of Buddha's body, we're speaking of a little different sense. Even his, even the emptiness of his mind, in emptiness of his omniscient mind, is considered a kaya, Buddha body, but it is uncompounded in nature. So, so, so in a way, it comes to the same, same, same thing as I was saying earlier: primordially free, primordially pure. Thus, because the mind's uh, very nature is undefiled, so the temporary defilements are tenable, are, are possible to be removed, because they have not mixed with the very part of the mind. Because if that were to be the case, then def- eliminating the defilements would also mean chipping off the mind. And thus, when all the elimination, developments are eliminated, mind would have already been exhausted. That, that means mind would be no more. So that's not the case. That doesn't have to be the case, because uh, the afflictions, no matter how thick, how strong, how deeply entrenched, have not entered the nature of the mind. In, in Usually I give this example of gold, gold mining. People go to so much uh, length in, in because this is almost like a easy easy money, but it takes so much pain, right? And you get very small amounts, but somehow whatever you get, they may come with mixed, may come mixed with dirts or not, but the dirts would not be considered to have entered the very nature of the gold. That's the reason why it is acceptable. Kishila, so yeah. can I just understand this particular, this line is talking about the impermanent part which becomes the wisdom dharmakaya. So it's not yeah. you know, this clear and cognizant nature of the mind, mm-hmm. which is a stable basis for the cultivation of all the qualities. Mm-hmm. So that is actually the impermanent part which becomes the wisdom dharmakaya. Yeah. Uh, whereas, so it's not... Is not referring to the natural dhammakaya, which is an which is an absence, which yeah. is a negative phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here, here we are speaking of uh, the, the in 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 certain tenet system, just this very quality is considered uh, Buddha nature. This the mind being capable, the mind mind being. The possibility of mind being separated from its adventitious uh, defilements itself is considered and Buddha nature. So that eventually progressively becomes the omniscient mind. So that's the that's the Buddha body in compound phenomena, compounded nature, in impermanent nature, and the very emptiness of the mind at any stage of our samsaric being, samsaric uh, existence, is considered the Buddha nature, which would eventually become, become in the sense, which would eventually lead to our having the uncompounded, our having the, the Dharmakaya, which is in the uncompounded, permanent nature. 
It's not that it, it kind of becomes the next, but, uh, the, but every moment of it progressively, uh, kind of, kind of, progressively kind of, uh, moves to becoming uh, closer and closer to the Dhammakaya in the, in the uncompounded nature, in the uncompounded aspect. Remember that, so we're moving to this next one. Remember that the mind can become habituated to excellent qualities, which can be built up cumulatively. There is a saying by, I think, Katamba Master, Chagawa, maybe Chagawa. The stained mind, or mind with stains. Our minds are, on the one hand, pure in its nature of being defiled, but at the same time, it is defiled. It is with defilement. So, so mind with defilement, a defiled mind, a stained mind, has one quality. That quality is however way you train, it will become it. Whatever training it you give to it, or whatever things you make it habituate into, it will pick it up. It depends on which direction you tilt, you pull. It will bend like that. So it has been pulled this direction so much, affliction, affliction direction so much that it has now, be, now, now formed a coil so unrelenting to turn back. You keep pulling, keep pulling, keep pulling. Eventually the, the circles will be bigger and bigger. Eventually it will turn like this. And then it will form this kind of foil, this kind of a coil. <laughs> So, in a way, it is not special with the excellent qualities for the mind to become habituated with. It's it's we are all testimony. Our our afflictions are very our afflictions are testimony to how one can be trained in the negative way. But what is special about excellent qualities is that once they are established, once they are say in the sense of understanding, once you have generated a strong conviction, strong conviction, then nobody can undo it. Nor do you have to ever relent to any kind of force to lose it. And thus it can be developed cumulatively, eventually, to the state of full awakening. In terms of being built up cumulatively, that's possible even with the negative things, but not to the point of retaining them at a time when we have become fully awakened, they would have to be shed. And this makes sense because we are working on just one base, mind, right? With mind as the base. And there too, not in a sense of something being put on the mind as a foundation or as a base, like, like on a table, but rather kind of the mind itself being trained so there's no way mind can hold both the negative and the positive at the same time. <laughs> you have to give, give, give up some one thing. So that's the reason. There is this, 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 uh, what do you call, mm, this principle of opposites at work. Whereas if anger were to be here, compassion here, here on the brain, then we can, develop brain and excess brain and then kind of technically, technologically kind of have them have full expression in such a way that the person would have so good compassion, so good anger. <laughs> That's not the case, yeah. Does it help to think about multiple lifetimes when considering this point? Or because some afflictions, they seem very strong. I've been working on them for a while and they just seem strong. Or good qualities, they still are weak. So is it um, helpful to like think very long term? 
it is not just helpful, it is uh, it may differ with individuals, but for some like me, it is realistic to think of various life lifetimes. And that way uh, uh, one would not feel discouraged, yet at the same time kind of uh, nudge a bit every step. The very fact that we are born as humans and have met Dharma, not only met but have interest in it, having interest is key. In Shantideva's text somewhere, he says, Buddha's teaching is rooted in Vipa. Vipa. In it, I think that's interest. We, some, sometimes people could say faith. Yeah, there are references to what is usually translated as faith. That's Depa Mundu Matar. Yeah, but you didn't Depa, which is usually translated as faith. But it is more of an informed understanding or informed inspiration. Not just blind faith, but informed inspiration. If, I mean, if one is capable of generating it. If not, for now, one might even have to do with just faith. I mean, one would have to have something. If informed faith is not around you and you cannot reach for it, just reach for something that could give you a nudge. <laughs> but at the same time, not be content with it, not because that will not uh, take us much further. There will be a time when it will be, what do you call snuck, snack, stuck. <laughs> it will be stuck. Just think of the path of preparation. Even before that, there's no way one could get an easy, easy pass without an understanding of emptiness. You cannot sneak through it. Just don't think that that's, they're the same, 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 uh, same thing could be applied, like going through a crowd, you could sneak through. There's no, no, one, there's not much crowd. <laughs> Another, even if there were to be, the system is so, so built, right, so tight, you cannot go through it. <laughs> so, but then in this other context, in Shantideva's text, he says, to be the, the root of Buddha's teaching doctrine is Mepa. I think it translates better into Mepa interest. So merely meeting the Dharma is not enough, although even that is difficult. But then making sense, connecting with it is difficult. And the fact that we have done this is is an indication that we might have sown seed in the past. For sure, there should be a seed, there should be a cause for that. Not everyone born as humans necessarily adopt any spirituality necessarily. Anything to do with working with the mind It is so in, so so interesting. I mean, this has been very very strong to me. Once I moved here, and then I look, oh, I was thinking, where you, are you kidding? Were you mad to be squandering you away your time like that after the office hour is over? Of course, once nine to five, perfect. I was fulfilling his holiness, his aspiration was doing my best, but after that, the forces of society, culture, custom, 
is so strong that you cannot stay away from. But once you give in, then the bond becomes so strong that you just naturally, and it happens one after the other. I mean, so coming here, I have come to make sense of how in the world did we squander away this end of eternity time. It is so easy. I can now make sense of how in the world in eternity could have passed without having really made any headway. Just and that's even the case speaking of human beings. Animals, what can we say? The turkeys keep I mean That's the reason why in this, in this, in this, in this homage to Buddha, this teacher of gods and humans, not animals, hell beings, they all left out. They do not make, with few exceptions, they do not make, make up, make, make up a viable vessel to be taught. So Buddha is among the qualities counted as teacher of gods and humans. You might say, it's unfair, what about animals? Hungry goes, oh, what can a Buddha do? There are exceptions, but otherwise, oh, it's, I've come to, I, I, I had, I used to have this qualm about having been in eternity, I mean, this way is eternity, right? There's no beginning. And we have been through that. And how in the world are we still like this? Anger, jealousy, greed, or the, the, the words in the three principles, aspects of the path, really strikes court. How we are driven by the forces of the four, rivers, and how we are how we are bound tight by karma. It's like we are driven by water. Now try to imagine, okay? You are human, but you are driven by it, right? You kind of carried away, floating. And then and then think of your arms being tight to the back and your legs tight. As if that, they, that we are not enough, you are now put in an iron cage that is locked. Iron cage to self-grasping. And this self-grasping within us is it's so strong. It's like an iron cage, locked up iron cage, and your limbs are all tied up. What hope do you have to open it? But banging with your head? Oh. But even doing that is difficult because all around there is thick darkness. Oh. And we keep going on, on, on. There's no end to that. Now looking at our situation, particularly making this shift, not being in the middle of it and being a part of it, but coming out, looking at I could see, oh, now I can make sense how eternity could pass without making any, any progress. It's, it's, yeah. And each life we begin, we, most of us naturally think that this is it. This is the first and the last. If we think like this, then no progress will be made at all. There will be no effort in breaking th through the samsaric boundary. We'll be like thinking of this as the pleasure group, <laughs> running, running about, eating, running about, meeting, playing, visiting places, eating, meeting, departing, 
But that's it. That's how the whole life passes. One life passes like this. Countless lives could pass like this. So, yeah, one insight I've got coming here is, yes, now I can make sense how eternity could pass. Now make sure this eternity doesn't <laughs> remain like this. Okay, so then let's look at the second, second, yeah, second one we have already looked at. But as I said earlier, um, excellent qualities, the positive qualities have, an, have, a, have, have one bonus point, one plus point, in that it is in sync with the reality. That's its very big force. So by undertaking it, by adopting it, one is not going further away from the reality. That's one thing, right? By engaging in it. And then in terms of realizations or not, it is in sync with the reality. So there's no deception there. And thus, following its footsteps will be in sync with the reality, in alignment with the reality. And, and thus, there is more prospect for it to, yeah, for it to stick around, for it to be uh, built stronger. Yes, please. I have a qualm about, like, uh, in having excellent qualities that can build cumulatively. That one, I understand uh, it being based on reality. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, how how does how is how is it um how is the um, i think by Bashika's view refuted where they say our hearts when they get really old and sick they actually lose those abilities and you know they don't go further than the path of seeing but they lose their arhatship so like i imagine if i become you know, get dementia, you know, somebody gets to really high realization, something happens physiologically, and the mind doesn't function, cannot function. So how does the quality kind of not get lost? Because you have um, dementia, Parkinson's, you can all kinds of neurological things. Yeah, not just that, you could, you could uh, lose the strength of one's concentration practices also. Yes. From that perspective. So how, but, but, how does that tell you with this? How, so how do we refute this, uh, the, this belief that you can lose your qualities that's been built up, all these good qualities based on reality? That is considered a provisional teaching. It was, it, it had its use on the occasion in the incident that Buddha taught. Uh, and also, it is useful to have as part of as as as, as part of a uh, what do you call a school of thought. Uh, but then it is considered uh, interpreted. So yeah, once you are hurt, you can never become. You you can never be. You can never undo it. So once you are arhat, there is no return back to any non-arhat, lowly beings. So this this tenet thing, as I said last time, it has to be seen like a chapter, the first chapter of the book, moving to the next one, the next one, the next one, the final message is here at the end. Last fifty pages, it gets refined. So it is, in this, it is quite interesting to learn specifically about Buddha's Gong Dem Gong. We call it Gong Dem Gong. Buddha's teaching, which are uh, skewed in so many ways deliberately at different occasions. And they have their own relevance at that time, but when taken out of context, they would only make for a provisional interpretive teaching. But for that particular person and that occasion, the only way it could have 
benefited him would be by taking it literally. So that's where the literality has a place, but not outside of it. So this, yeah, the whole of Ibasika could be taken as a stepping stop, stepping stone to becoming Sautantrika, that as stepping stone to becoming Chitta Madra, that as stepping stone to becoming Sautantrika Madhavika, that as stepping stone to becoming Prasankhya. Now in terms of the objective reality, you have gotten the, the ultimate understanding of it. All that's required to do is now think or shift the focus on the subjective component of that path and then now kind of refine it. Which one? Oh, yeah, yeah. I see, 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 I see. Okay, okay. So how we how one refuses is that one one when you speak of arhat in the purely vibhashika sense, there's not the arhat at all. They didn't have the tool of becoming arhat. So that's why we have this expression called arhats in accordance with Abhidhamma are not arhats. In actuality, they are arhats in the school of Abhidhamma. In accordance with that, they fulfill all the qualities, have all these achievements. But that's not enough. I mean, just for one thing, the, 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 the view on which they base their cultivation itself is far short of the so the Prasangika Madhimika view. We do not have to call it Prasangika Madhimika view. That that view itself is far short of addressing all the all the elements of objectivity. It has it is in a way at the Vashika level all loaded with, all based on, founded on objectivity. How how would that lead us to? And then one thing, at the Vaibhashika level, not only at the Vaibhashika level, at the Sautantra level, there's no mention whatsoever of the selflessness of phenomena. That is not even mentioned, not even a phenomena. If that's the case, that speaks of whatever they claim to be the selflessness of person, even that is affected. So how they make it presentation on the afflictions, even that is affected. So, as I said last time, I challenged you by saying that, except for Prasangika Madhimika, Prasangika said just in terms of the Sutra, Prasangika Madhimika set aside, all the rest fall in one group, which has just one singular system of afflictions. That includes Chitta Madhra, Satantrika Madhimika even, even allowing that they come up with much, much sophisticated view. Say in the case of Chitamata, they come up with an additional view of how things are mere mind only. And then there's the Sautantrika within that. There are some who buy into this Chitamata view. On top of that, come up with their own, own take of what they claim to be Madhyamika view. Likewise. But nonetheless, they all fall in one group when it comes to the presentation of the afflictions. It's the same. So much so that the, aff the afflictions being explained by the uh, Prasangika Madhimika is called the unique to the Prasangika view. And somehow, now it be, it's, it's making sense to me. Uh, earlier, uh, it has not made any sense. We have a way of calling uh, the, the afflictions unique to the prasangika system and the afflictions uh, that is common uh, with all the rest of them, or rest of the uh, view, then uh, holders. One is called Miknam Chen, another is called Tsungdeng um, Nyamong. 
So the one in Prasangika Madhyamika is called Nyomong, which are, which share, Nyomong uh, afflicted, afflicted. By the way, Nyomong, glacier, is not just emotions, right? That's very important to understand. It has both cognitive and, and affective components. So I usually call them dissonant mental states or afflictive mental states. Uh, so the unique afflictive men mental states that they identify is called sungdenji nyomong, afflictions which are concomitant. Concomitant to what? To self-grasping itself. So the afflictions themselves are self-grasping in nature. That is not the case with all the afflictions that the, that the rest of the schools present. It comes far short of that. And theirs is called, now it is making sense, theirs is called Mignam Jen. Afflictions which has, I mean literally afflictions which have, which have mm, Mignam Jen, observing object, Mik mikpa, what do you call it? Mikpa. Oh yeah, um, observatory objects, observed object, and what do you call the other one? Aspect. The apprehension aspect. Okay, you may call it apprehension aspect, and the and the. Uh, mm, yeah. Appearing object would be same as the observed object, and the apprehension object would be the same as the uh, that which that which accounts for the aspect. So theirs is called afflictions with observed object and aspect. Not that the afflictions in the system of Prasangik Madhimika doesn't have object or apprehension. But there is one which is objectified, solidified, even even what do you call philosophically advocated by them. So it's quite interesting. There is a whole separate section in in learning about how. Buddha's teaching uh, not only fall into uh, definitive and interpretive, but within the interpretive, how varied they are, interpretive in so many different ways. So interesting. Somehow we call them gong them gong. Gong them gong. But I have difficulty putting it across. <laughs> Something to do with gong si gong ba. Kongshi Kongba. Kongba is the intent. Kongshi is the reference point for the intent. Something like that. So based on that, it, it kind of makes this plus presentation of the of the inter interpretive teachings. So from that you can find that includes one with one that includes one uh, where Buddha taught, actually had in reference for the intent that there's 12 links, but he didn't call them by those names. He called them as father, mother, right? You remember that? Oh, yeah. Father, mother, uh, mother uh, king and his attendants, his, his entire empire, etc., etc. That made perfect sense at that time. There, that person needed to hear, yes, father and mother are to be killed. That person definitely needed it to be taken as a literally. He could have asked, did I hear you correctly? Did you say father and mother are to be killed? But I would have said, yes, I did. You better understand it. And that was the right thing he needed to hear. And then when he came to senses, he was kind of, Heaved a sigh and then said, Okay, what I thought was terrible is not something Buddha disapproved. Even Buddha approved it. 
And when he came to senses, he began to think, wait a minute, did Buddha say that? Did he really mean it? Then he went to the Buddha and asked, and said, no, I didn't mean it to be literally taken. Although at that time, it definitely you needed to hear it. That is included in it. And still, likewise, there are so many of them. Yeah. And then philosophically, we could speak of the tenets, the tenets system. Not everything uh, that is Vavashika should be trashed. <laughs> Some could carry on, but most of them can be. They just don't reach. So, yeah. So that's why it is so interesting to see those lines, along those lines. I mean, I have, this is not new to you. I have spoken several times saying you could pull just one topic, two truths, and then look at it and then see progression of refinement. To begin with, the two truths has to do with dividing the whole phenomena into two categories. Not united. But then when you come to Chitra Matara, you, you unite it. You speak of two truths on one thing. And then it stays like this, and it becomes more refined, and when it comes to prasangika. So it's a way of training in thinking along, thinking in, in terms of two truths. And then beginning with uh, gross understandings, and then even refining it. Yeah. Yes, please. Sorry. I think I caught what you were saying some. I just want to check. Huh? I think if I understood you right, you were saying that the prasangikas versus all the other schools have a different way of looking at the afflictions. And where I'm not sure if I understood this right, the, were you saying the Pasangaka, all of the afflictions are involved with self-grasping? Involved, of course. Not all of them are necessarily concomitant with self-grasping. Mm -hmm. So, it is not trashing all of the afflictions presented by the, all the schools. Pasangaka Mata Mika is keeping them. And then bringing more discoveries. Like, look deeper, right? Self-grasping is there, and that's generating something that you even don't even speak of. You don't even make a presentation about, make a system about. Because all that is affliction in their sense, in their, in their sense is something that is generated by uh, grasping at self, but of the grosser level. And they all share in this. There is a... Yes, so, please. As far, so yeah. then where did the observed object and the apprehended object fit into that? And who, yeah, yeah. Who, for which were they the same? Yeah. In, in, in a way, calling them by that name, as if to imply that the unique afflictions in the Prasangika Madhimika would not have observed object or even aspects, right? It, it's, it's, it sounds almost like that, but that's not the case. It is to, what do you call, uh, intensify their advocacy of whatever things it may be, including observed object and aspect, everything having objective reality. So that, that's how I make of it now. Otherwise, I always had this difficulty. But yeah, uh, difficulty in the sense of like saying all afflictions, even the ones that the person Madhimika speak of having being uh, of being concomitant in the same category with the self grasping itself has observed object, has aspects like that. And then how do you make the how do you draw the line? Because that seems to overlap with the affliction, afflictions of the person Madhimika, even including the unique ones. Not the ones, unique ones, are shared by them. Because they don't even identify, they don't even speak of self-grasping as a problem. Let alone be a cause of afflictions. Yeah, here, grasping at inherent existence. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Although, when we say self-grasping, grasping at 
selfhood of a person, the term is very generic. It's generic, it's shared by all the Buddhists. But what you mean is different. So there is one uh, additional hominem. <laughs> okay, so, ah, okay, let, let's look at third one. <laughs> Contemplate that excellent qualities can be enhanced, but never diminished by reasoning and wisdom. So it is, it, we should not be so naive, right? Because in taking it so literally, it's saying that once we have developed, built excellent qualities to a certain level, then yes, they, they adopt a quality. They, they, be, they begin to have this quality of never being lost. So, in terms of understanding, it will be a f un unwavering, unquestionable conviction into it. Then it will be not only in sync with the reality, you, nobody can, no force can talk you out of it. And naturally there can be no, no opposition to it. Because even if self-grasping were to try, it would, have, it would be banging its head against a rock or against a wall. It would be like throwing. It would be like throwing butter on on the rock. <laughs> no matter whether you throw rock on the butter or rock butter or butter on the rock, butter will always lose. <laughs> There's a Tibetan expression I'm translating directly. Tomarlashuna marfam, martolashuna marfam. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Reasoning wise, it makes perfect sense. Uh -huh. But then, this is kind of a touchy subject, but then. It's extremely discouraging when we see the behavior of some highly realized, supposedly tukus, who, like, what happened to their permanently developed... You already answered my question, what? your question. What? Supposedly. Supposedly. I yeah. So, yeah. that's it. I mean, what is in reality, what is happening is this not there. So, I mean, it's a cultural thing. Right, reincarnation is a cultural thing. Even I think His Holiness the Thirteen Dalai he has publicly acknowledged that not everyone I recognize are really true incarnates. I just looked for the best out of the candidates because if you, and also I will give it to, to another occasion when we could have a one to one discussion to share to share something that speaks perfectly. To your question, but but in a way you already answered by saying supposedly, right? That is itself we're making very. I understand that um, what might be called an arhat in one school yeah. is not by the prasangika considered an arhat. But what if someone is truly an arhat, and and then they suffer a brain injury? What in the life they became an arhat in? How do you refute then that? they can't lose their realization. Oh, I see, I see. Oh, yeah, yeah. I can, I can say that because the arhatship is something not on their brain or not on their body, it's in their, on their mind. The quality of the arhat is a cessation. And the cessation is something that is, that is attained in the mind. So body is temporary. That's the reason why in the Abhish, in the Vaibhashaka and others, they don't even consider Buddha's body as anything special. It is even true suffering. So likewise, there can be uh, arhats who have ordinary body, right, undergoing those things. But if they are true arhats, there's no return for the uh, the, the level of cessation that they have gained. In it. By the way, in the uh, not I'm not oh, yeah arhats are said to have s uh, certain um, 
Uh, what do you call? Mm. Pardon? What is that? Oddities. Yeah, oddities, oddities. Perfect, perfect. That will do. That will do. <laughs> oddities because of their habituation. Habituation. Yeah, even from this Prasangika Madhika Mega point of view also. Yeah. But in the case of the Bodhisattvas, uh, once you become, once you become Arya, not just Arhat, but Arya. Yeah, you don't even have any pain, bodily pain. No mental pain. And you do not, yeah, one thing, and you do not accumulate or commit any new karma, new throwing karma at all. Uh, that's when now, now, the clock is ticking, right, to become Buddha. One has to attain a sense of security, no matter what, not going down at all. The only part. Pardon? Yeah, I'm saying not even in samsara. No, no, do not accumulate any new karma. Not only in the case of the bodhisattvas, not only they do not accumulate any new throwing karma into samsara, even as a human being, but they do not at all take birth under the influence of afflictions and karma at all. From that point of view, from that point on. Now, in terms of going into the lower realms, yeah, it's it it even happens. Before, before, before the path of seeing, even before attaining any uh, any real cessation, like it's the second or the third path of preparation before we don't before it's not possible to fall into the lower realms. Mm -hmm. right? So even so, so even. Um, I guess my point was trying to, to respond to this. It's not like um, w once you become a bodhisattva, you're safe. You're not. Oh, no, no. For a long time. Yeah, yeah. N not necessarily a long time. It will depend on how much, how... <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. So I'm wondering what you think about this, because in this whole questioning, I'm thinking about something Jeffrey Hopkins is talked to us about his own life. Mm -hmm. and it gave me a lot of faith in the power of the mind mm -hmm. and the separating the mind from the body because he's had many health problems. He's actually had to re-access many things that he lost during major health crises or oh, yeah. problems. Mm -hmm. And the way he thinks of it is that it's all there. It's like the mind is all there. It's this can the body do its thing to, I mean, he didn't explain it this way, but for him, it's just a matter of opening up these doors again, is I think the words that he used. Yeah. So my question to you about that, because I actually, I mean, I believe his experience and it makes sense to me, but I was, I'm kind of under the impression that some of these things are, when we talk about tendencies going forward in future lives, it doesn't have to be realizations, just habituations. So if we've habituated ourselves to like, kind of, trying to really work on a certain good quality, you would yeah, think, yeah. even if you don't have a realization, that oh, yeah, yeah. you would have that tendency. Karmically, you've, you're you going to have concordant uh, results. I'm totally with you. I'm totally with you. That's the reason why there's this great emphasis on what, for lack of a better term, Willem, the aspiration. Aspiration, it's... Unlike dedication, aspiration is kind of, uh, kind of, uh, it, it stands out as some force by which you could mobilize your, your merits, kind of direct and mobilize your merits. So it's very, usually it's given the analogy, it's given, it's, it's likened as the rian. If you are riding on a horse, 
rains. Yeah, the rains. Oh, okay, <laughs> the rains. Yeah, where you pour. That's likened to what Mulam can do. So, habituating, in a way, kind of expressing a strong wish. If you keep doing it, that will become part of your mind. You will wish it. The more you wish it, there's more likelihood that you would do it, given the opportunity, given the chance. Or you would tend to do it. Or you, you could naturally uh, go for that because of the force of the wish that you have been consistently making. That's actually expressed in when we talk about the results of karma, the tendency to do the action again. Mm-hmm. And here we're talking about doing a mental action again. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But yeah, but it is that is that is actually the part of the package of the karma. So karma may have been done, maybe 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 done with with its throwing effect. But it can still have the residue of, uh, what do you call? The habit, the con, the concordant, the concordant result. So that is in there with or without Mulam. With or without aspiration. So aspiration, we speak, we specifically speak in terms of positive merits that you have generated. You kind of wish for it to be part of. Be, 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 become cause for some other... When, when you make that aspiration, though, that that's a mental action. That's cre- And you're doing that over and over again. You're creating yeah, yeah. the cause to do have that aspiration uh, again later. Definitely. That, that will definitely happen with the mental aspects also. But what, what we are speaking of as concordance uh, aspects of the karma, that's not m- merely limited to mental karma, but even with physical karma. And, yeah. There's one question I need to expect. <laughs> I have a question. So, when I read the questions, I do not mention names of who the questioner is. That's my uh, way of doing it. I, uh, see, when it comes to cultural things, I have very little sensitivity to it. So, I may be completely reading it wrong. <laughs> so, I have a question about the prayer before teachings. It says, through purity, freeing from attachment. What does that mean? What is the purity this verse talks about? And how does it free one from attachment? That's about the Dharma, right? By the way, the, the purity spoken of here uh, is the cessation cessation so it's 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 in the tibetan it's all in the past tense because now you have attained the least amount of cessation least amount the least level of the actual cessation you would have already rendered that corresponding level of attachment completely unreturnable So when we speak of the the Sangha and the Dharma, unlike Buddha, where we are speaking of all the qualities at the consummate, culminating level, when we speak of Dharma and Sangha, then we are speaking of qualities from the path of seeing onward. So it couldn't be in different grades. So this purity here is this, the the the, uh, the true cessation of the, the the of of and of which the least level will be that of the that that attained during the path of seeing, and then it's built up. To that extent, one would be completely freed of the attachment corresponding to that level of cessation. True virtue, here I think it is the path, or path-like qualities, bring from lower realms. Because in the case, in the, in the context of Dharma, the least, the least level of path and uh, deserving to be called Dharma is the path of seeing. And 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 by that level, you would have re- re- attained a very secure 
secure uh, path uh, that would uh, ensure not falling into the lower rims. Actually, the, the, the quality you attained before that, but in terms of really sealing it, sealing the deal, you do it then. <laughs> and likewise, in the case of the Sangha, having prayed themselves have to be understood in their own respective level, not completely freed. Having prayed themselves, showing the path, have freed of corresponding level of afflictions. Because when we speak of Sangha, that ranges from those on the path of seeing onward. And if we want to speak it in distinct from the Buddha, then all the way up to the very end of a sentient being. Last. So that's the purity. And okay, that's, that's the purity. So it's, it's a matter of how you translate it. Otherwise, nah. in the Tibetan, it is all in past tense. But speaking of the range of true cessation, true path, likewise with the case of the being, with the case of the beings attaining those that with the Sangha, they are also spoken of in ranges. With that, I will stop here. We made a huge headway. <laughs> Not just one, two, even three. We just have only one left. Somehow today I have some energy. This the voice is clear. <laughs> okay. Let's do the dedication. <laughs>